Hello and welcome to Housing Cooperatives 101, Models, Methods, and Mutual Ownership by the North American Students of Cooperation, NASCO. Um, my name is Brel Hantanopalenke, NASCO's Director of Development Services. I use they and them pronouns. And I'm joined today by Daniel Miller. Daniel Miller, please feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Daniel Miller. I use he and him pronouns and I serve as NASCO's Director of Graphics. So uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about um, housing co-ops in the intro, uh, but NASCO is a network of 45 housing cooperatives that have about 3,500 individual residents across the United States and Canada. Uh, we support housing co-ops in all phases to evolve and deal with transitions as well as to improve internal functions. We also facilitate mutual aid and support amongst co-ops and promote the cooperative movement as a whole. We host uh, conferences and events for our members, uh, including our flagship annual conference of cooperators from across the continent. Uh, we have host staff and managers conferences, uh, host an internship network, provide property management services to uh, cooperatives through NASCO Properties, uh, offer cooperative development support for the folks who are trying to start or expand their existing housing cooperatives. Uh, we also provide direct consulting for organizations that are setting up proof equity housing co-ops and weave networks between housing co-ops and other organizations throughout uh, the US and Canada. So I'm going to talk for a moment about what it is that makes an organization a cooperative. Uh, there are a few principles that are recognized internationally for how cooperatives are defined and how they are distinct from other forms of business. So a couple of those principles that define what a cooperative is include voluntary and open ownership. Uh, you'll sometimes also see this as voluntary and open membership, that the co-op is available as an option for anybody who meets its eligibility requirements and it's not um, purely a private club. Uh, and that that membership is voluntary and not something that can be required or compelled, um, for example, by a, a government or legal regulation. Um, Co-ops also have democratic owner control. So the members slash owners of the cooperative own the organization. They may own it by each owning shares of the organization, or they might collectively own the organization as a group. Uh, but in any case, the organization is ultimately owned by its members. They have owner economic participation uh, in the case of housing co-ops. That's going to mean that the people who are living at the property and are paying rent to the organization are the members. And so the co-op is largely uh, funded through the activity of its members. That they are autonomous and independent. So they are separate from local government entities or other entities that they um, enter into relationships because it is in the best interests of the members and the organization, uh, that they have education, training, and information as one of their principles, because if the organization is going to be run by the members, then the members need to have information about how the organization works so that they can be effective stewards of the co-op. Uh, cooperatives also show cooperation among cooperatives and say that these are uh, related businesses that have some mutual interests. And so wherever it is possible and makes sense that co-ops will try to work with other cooperatives uh, in business relationships. And the cooperatives have concern for the community. The co-op is made of, by, and for the people who are its members. And anybody in the community that meets eligibility can be members. And so therefore the co-ops have a concern for the community. They're not just sort of located uh, at a community. They are part of a community. A few things about the structure of a housing co-op, and you'll sometimes hear consumer co-ops or worker co-ops or producer co-ops. That's the relationship of the members to the business. And so in a consumer co-op, the members are the people who are consuming the goods and services of the business. And in a housing co-op, which is usually gonna be a consumer co-op, that means that the people who consume the housing services from the co-op are the members. The people who live there are the members. So in most of these consumer co-ops, you'll see a structure where the general membership are seen as the highest authority within the organization. Uh, so you can see in this chart that they're sort of up here at the top, 
And that means that collectively, the membership is the highest authority within the organization. Not that any one person is, but as a class of people, the, the members uh, can make effective control and set the direction to the organization. The board of directors uh, are elected by those members. The board of directors would then hire an executive staff to set the direction for any operational business that staff are handling. And then the executive staff would oversee and employ uh, the rest of the staff team. So in the case of a housing co-op, this might mean that your membership as a whole come together and elect a smaller group to be a board who can make decisions more quickly and uh, are meeting the legal requirement to have a board of directors. The board would hire somebody into a management role or hire multiple people into management roles as a team. Uh, those managers would then employ and oversee the rest of the team. And the management staff in this case might mean, you know, if you have three people who are on site for maintenance work, but one person is coordinating all of that maintenance work. So you might have sort of a middle management layer if your co-op is large enough. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about other types of co-ops that are not just housing co-ops, just so that this is part of a broader context, that there are also worker co-ops where the employees are the members and then your workers are going to be collectively the membership that set those decisions. Uh, producer co-op where, uh, for example, in agriculture, if you were growing or producing a product, you might have a group of people growing that product who collectively are the membership of a co-op and then it's a co-op to sell sugar or grain or dairy. Uh, a purchasing co-op, uh, this is a, a version of a consumer co-op, but it's specific where um, it is the group of people who are collectively buying things like a bulk purchasing co-op. So sometimes you'll see this in grocery spaces as a group of people bulk ordering groceries. You also see this in some other uh, business settings where you might have cooperatives that collectively it's the franchise owners that are the members and then they can collectively purchase items for their businesses. Um, you have hybrid worker and consumer co-ops. These are relatively common, particularly in uh, some retail co-ops where you have the consumers buying the product from the co-op and also the workers running the daily business of the co-op. And those groups are both represented as members. Uh, insurance co-ops are um, more of a kind of purchasing co-op in most cases, but specialized around purchasing insurance. Uh, child care co-ops, um, which again can be a worker or consumer co-op, but where the co-op's business is about child care and taking care of children. Uh, Health care co-ops, which are um, often overlapping with insurance co-ops, but where the members are purchasing health care as a group. Want to talk a little bit about, uh, in the earlier chart, we mentioned staff and board and members as different roles within the organization. This is a, another way of slicing that relationship. Uh, to say that there's this sort of spectrum of information and authority and that members are going to have a great deal of authority. The, the membership as a group is the highest authority in most co-op structures. Uh, so the members as a group are able to make decisions and uh, set the direction for the co-op, but they also tend to be the people with the least information. The members are unlikely to know exactly which plumber was used two years ago for a renovation or how to file the tax returns for employment benefits. Uh, so the members have a great deal of authority, but have less information about the day-to-day -day business and workings of the co-op. The staff will typically have the least authority. Staff can't unilaterally go and set the direction for the co-op or make big programming decisions, but they have a great deal of information about how these things happen in a mechanical way. Uh, the board is a bit of a bridge between these two groups. The board is getting a lot more reports from the staff. Uh, the board is going to be more aware of how the staff are performing their duties and are going to be seeing that big picture. Uh, but they also have authority that's been delegated to them by the membership. So the board can act as a bridge where the board is reporting to the membership about the co-op's activities from the information that they're getting from staff. Uh, and the board is also communicating back to the staff with the direction that the members have set in the co-op's mission. Do you want to talk briefly about the difference between 
general membership and individual members. We mentioned a couple times here that the members are the highest authority within the co-op, but that doesn't mean that any one member is the highest authority within the co-op, that the membership as a whole, as a group of people are the highest authority. So the individual members have slightly different responsibilities than what the general members have and a slightly different relationship to decision-making. And individual members are gonna be able to contribute to the co-op's work, are going to be following policies, are going to be informed about what's going on in the co-op. Uh, individual members are going to generally support the co-op's mission and why you're there. Uh, individual members are going to take part in group decision making and contribute towards votes. But it's the general membership that are finally making those decisions. It's not just an individual casting their vote. The general membership as a whole says, we've collected the votes and here's the outcome. The membership as a whole are the ones who are more likely to be establishing or defining the mission. They might delegate that to the board and say that the board should be setting the mission, but in general, the board serves at the pleasure of the membership. And so the membership are going to be overseeing that. Um, they're also going to be delegating other kinds of authority to the board for other kinds of policies that are being set. The membership might be delegating authority to the staff or um, specifically management staff for setting employment policies or day-to-day -day decisions in the office. And the general membership is also going to be making sure that the co-op is accessible to its members. If you are making decisions as a group, but not everybody in the group is able to participate in them, either because of the process you're using or the mechanics, uh, or because members aren't getting enough information to make an informed decision, uh, then that's something that the membership as a whole is responsible for making sure that that process is something that is available to the individuals that make up that membership. Um, and then lastly, just want to speak very briefly because we mentioned earlier that voluntary and open membership is one of the defining characteristics of what a co-op is. Um, and so for a co-op to continue to be accessible to people within the community and continue to bring in new members over time, the co-op really does have to focus on being open to members of the community and trying to remove barriers from participation. The co-op also needs to be very mindful of the ways in which you are contributing to the oppression of other members. If your co-op is reproducing systems of racism or homophobia or ableism that exist in the outside world without critically examining them, then you're going to find that the people who are either within your membership at all or within your membership in an active role or stepping into leadership positions are not going to reflect the community around you. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we'll move into uh, understanding some of the specifics around housing co-ops um, themselves as, uh, as separate from other kinds of uh, cooperatives. And so specifically here, we're going to dive into some of the definitions. Um, uh, fundamentally, uh, a cooperative, in any case, is going to be a democratic member owned and controlled and or, uh, or sorry, a member controlled or member owned legal entity. Uh, and fundamentally for a housing cooperative, the thing that it does is it owns and or manages real estate. Uh, final and ultimate decision making power with uh, a housing cooperative is going to rest with the members and that's that member control that's there uh, for a housing co-op. However, what a member is uh, actually defined as um, is going to be based on your co-op's membership guidelines. Um, people can become members in a housing cooperative either by purchasing a share in the cooperative or by signing a membership agreement in the case of a non-equity or group equity housing co-op. Uh, each member who has either purchased a share or has signed a membership agreement is generally granted the right to occupy one housing unit or room um, and defined access to some of the common facilities. Uh, what a housing unit is and what a room is defined as is going to be set up in your co-ops uh, articles or declaration um, or other organizing documents. Members are able to exert their member control directly or through their elected representatives. Um, and, through, and using those, uh, those systems, uh, those members will review membership applications, set eligibility requirements for uh, folks who are trying to become members of the co-op, and then set any other policies and pricing for the co-op. 
so that is to say that those eligibility requirements that are set apply to current and future uh, members as well. There are broadly uh, three types of housing cooperative. Uh, and this slide's a little text heavy, uh, but feel free to pause it and uh, read through these because there is uh, a lot of kind of comparative data here. Um, and each row here is kind of uh, compared to the, um, or e each column here is compared to the other type uh, in the same row. Um, the most commonly understood and, uh, and known type of housing cooperative are market rate uh, co-ops. Those are set up so that the individual member shares are sold on the open market. Uh, it, the individual division of unit ownership is set such that uh, when you buy a share, you're getting that individual unit and you're also then uh, gaining equity as the property value increases. Um, this is most frequently used in apartment style complexes. Um, and any of the shared equity that's uh, set up on a usually a pro rata basis for the housing co-op can be used for expansion and renovation. On the other end uh, of the spectrum, there are group equity housing cooperatives. Uh, in group equity housing cooperatives, the structure is a lot more like uh, a rental uh, structure wherein, uh, or like tenants in common. Uh, there isn't a share purchase usually, uh, at, but there is usually a security deposit that's charged. Um, that security deposit is usually fairly low. Uh, in the case of a group equity housing cooperative, the real estate is all collectively owned. So the individual member by signing a membership agreement doesn't gain a personal equity position in the corporation. Uh, they instead uh, manage, uh, collect, or are able to collectively manage the equity of the co-op. Uh, since all of the equity is held by the co-op, that can all be used for future expansion or renovation, um, but none of that is going to end up going to the individual members. There's not any direct wealth building based on in the group equity model. Um, these are most frequently shared residential spaces, so single room occupancy often, um, but this model can also apply to apartment style co-ops or condominium style co-ops as well. Um, if you, the goal is to maintain uh, the most uh, affordable at, uh, entry into uh, home control. Um, since group equity housing cooperatives don't really uh, create direct wealth building opportunities for uh, members and market rate co-ops offer kind of like that, uh, that constant uh, in, like intergenerational wealth building that's, uh, that is tied to property value increases, um, there's often uh, a desire to kind of split the difference to allow for some access to folks who are lower income, while also uh, trying to have some of the share appreciation that is tied to market rate co-ops. And that's where we get the limited equity co-op model, um, which kind of splits the difference between the two. Um, limited equity co-ops uh, do have share purchases, but there are usually limits on how much those shares can be sold at uh, in order to stay affordable. Um, those limits are set by the members. Uh, and uh, because the limits are set by the members, there is some pressure often to take your limited equity co-op and collectively uh, decide to move market rate. Um, and that's, that's going to be a pressure that limited equity co-ops always are going to have to push against. Uh, with limited equity housing co-ops, there is, just like in the market rate co-op, an individual division of unit ownership and some percentage of the commons. Uh, the shared equity, again, can be used for renovation and expansion. Uh, that's, or at least the equity that's owned by the co-op as a whole. And that limited percentage of the equity is going to be set to stay with uh, that the individual member as the value increases of each unit. Uh, limited equity co-ops set their resale formulas and their uh, equity retention formulas individually. So they're all gonna be a little different. Uh, and uh, for more uh, explicit details on uh, share re uh, resale formulas and uh, equity limits, you can. Uh, feel free to reach out to the National Association of Housing Cooperatives. Um, they have a whole lot of information on uh, resale formulas and uh, share limitations. Um, limited equity co-ops are most often seen in apartment style complexes or in co-housing um, and occasionally in the shared residential space. Uh, space. If there's a short takeaway though, from each of these uh, models, you'll note that with group equity housing co-ops, they are the best at keeping costs low over time, um, but they don't produce direct individual wealth building. Um, 
an individual who's in a group equity housing co-op could of course reinvest their uh, savings in some other uh, money-making enterprise. Uh, market rate co-ops provide the most opportunity for individuals to build wealth based on uh, real estate appreciation, but they don't necessarily have a direct focus on keeping costs low or keeping the units accessible. Uh, and then limited equity housing co-ops try to split the difference. There's some individual wealth building and they're pretty good at keeping costs low over time. Uh, and then we'll move on to a couple of co-op examples uh, with Daniel. Thank you, bro. So we have a couple of examples along with some sort of reference photos to give you a sense of the scale here. So here's example number one, uh, Co-op City, you may have heard of in New York. Uh, Co-op City is a population of roughly 44,000 people. Uh, it's a very large development. It is the world's largest limited equity housing co-op. Uh, it was built on a community land trust in the early 70s. Uh, it is currently predominantly African-American along with uh, Latino members and a smaller percentage of other groups. Uh, co-op city was established decades ago and has been successful ever since. And the stated purpose was to create affordable housing co-ops that are sort of both rental co-ops and cooperatively owned. Uh, you can see that there are uh, various sort of amenities offered to the members within this larger co-op complex. Uh, it was created um, as a way to have the projects be controlled by the residents as an alternative to landlord controlled housing and has been there ever since. Another example would be the Madison Community Co-ops or MCC in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this is a much smaller co-op organization with 200 members living in 11 different properties in downtown Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this co-op is a group equity housing co-op where the group collectively owns all of the properties, but no individual member owns any shares or units within those properties. I, this was founded in the late 1960s. Uh, members decided that a group of uh, isolated independent co-ops should be banding together into a single organization. Uh, there have been a number of sort of changes after that group federated and as its membership and politics evolved over the decades since, but the organization is still there and serving members with affordable housing decades later. Another example would be NASCO Properties, uh, sometimes called NP, which was created in the late 1980s. Uh, this is a consumer housing co-op using a group equity ownership structure. Uh, NASCO Properties exists as a bit of a land trust of cooperatives or like a co-op of co-ops, where each one of the local organizations is leasing properties from the central organization. And then each leasing organization appoints people to the board of the central organization. NASCO Properties exists in order to be uh, an option that is more independent than being a single large co-op organization that is all located in one place, but uh, also to have the independence and flexibility that comes with separate co-ops in different places being able to make decisions based on their local real estate market or what housing stock is available to them. Uh, so you can see here, here are a few more examples with photos from NASCO Properties Cooperatives. Um, each one of these co-ops is able to make some of their own decisions over local member needs, local building needs. So they have a blend of local control and access to the shared resources that come with being part of a larger organization. Another example here is Rock USA, which uh, Rock stands for Resident Owned Communities. Rock USA is another hybrid organization where they exist. Uh, these resident owned communities are cooperatives that focus on manufactured housing parks, um, sometimes called mobile home parks. Uh, so these are manufactured housing parks. Rock USA's role is to take these parks out of private investor ownership and move them into affordable community ownership. So Rock USA helps groups on the ground, uh, organize, come together, go through the loan process, negotiating the purchase, dealing with the business planning, 
uh, and RockUSA assists them with that work. RockUSA then uh, turns over the ownership of those properties to the local cooperative. Those local cooperatives are generally a group ownership of the land and the infrastructure on that land for things like septic and roads and lighting. Um, and then typically the rock communities are going to have individual ownership of each unit of manufactured housing that somebody purchased to bring to the co-op, but then they are leasing the land that the housing sits on. Um, that's also particular to the way that manufactured home parks are usually structured where people tend to own their own uh, manufactured unit of housing and they're looking for a place to put it. Uh, so Rock USA exists to serve the needs of those communities and also to preserve those parks because they tend to offer very affordable housing in the places where they're working. And so Rock USA sees those as a good fit for housing cooperatives that are locally controlled by the residents. Uh, so we're going to go into a little bit about why would anybody go through the, all the trouble of setting up uh, this slightly more complex form of home ownership in the first place. So generally speaking, uh, cooperative housing uh, produces significantly higher satisfaction uh, for people who are living in those, uh, those units as opposed to comparable affordable rental housing units. So this is a really big deal um, to improve people's quality of life. Uh, additionally, uh, there's safety and power in numbers. Uh, so it's good to note that uh, participation in functioning uh, housing cooperatives is a really effective tool to help prevent in community crime and vandalism. Um, so there are significantly lower rates of crime and vandalism in uh, housing co-ops as, as opposed to uh, comparable affordable rental housing. Um, additionally, co-op residents, uh, because they have this organization to work with, are often engaged in working on issues that are there to improve their communities. It's also tied to that uh, seventh principle of concern for community. Uh, limited equity and group equity housing co-ops also are really powerful tools to push back against uh, gentrification and displacement. Um, many of those housing co-ops have affordable housing missions and uh, encourage activism to preserve affordable housing um, and to maintain diversity in especially like tight uh, urban markets. Uh, additionally, uh, it's good to note that um, group equity housing co-ops um, frequently have kind of higher turnover and a more transient population um, than limited equity housing co-ops do due to the lower uh, equity entry barrier, um, which means that uh, it is really important for uh, group equity housing co-ops, despite the fact that they are generally the most affordable style of housing, um, that they um, actively continue to engage with the, the community and recruit locally so that they don't end up becoming just kind of like a place for uh, out of towners to move in uh, for a short period of time. Uh, appreciating assets. Uh, members in uh, especially those resident owned communities, those rocks, um, uh, experience significant appreciation in the value of their homes, um, have greater say in their housing conditions, and pay lower monthly fees than folks who are in non-cooperatively managed rental parks. The fact that folks in manufactured home communities are seeing appreciation as opposed to depreciation in their unit is a really big deal for folks who uh, purchase those units. Uh, most group equity uh, housing co-ops and many limited equity housing co-ops do a really great job of preserving long-term affordability, uh, long affordability than um, often even some community land trusts and other deep restriction programs. Um, the fact that the residents directly manage and approve the uh, increases in future co-op charges is key to that. Um, that isn't to say that uh, I, any of those other programs are, you know, are not good. They are extremely good and really, really important and helpful. Uh, but it is important to note that those things can work in tandem with this to provide long-term affordability. Uh, additionally, uh, cooperatives are lower risks to lenders and the government generally. Um, this, uh, this graphic right here uh, is a comparison of comparable co-op loans to comparable single and multifamily uh, general uh, loans that are available. Uh, if you look at the likelihood of 90 day delinquencies on single family home ownership uh, loans. Um, those are in the 4% to like 3.5% on the overall like Fannie and Freddie 
uh, rates. Uh, with share loans for co-op units, we're looking at about half that, um, so at around 1.8% uh, of a 90-day delinquency rate. Uh, for multifamily uh, blanket mortgages, there's about a half a percent likelihood of 60-day uh, delinquency in those. And for co-op blanket mortgages, uh, we're looking at you know, far less than a tenth of a percent um, uh, likelihood of that. So this is a, a really big deal for lenders and for government entities that are uh, uh, establishing loans to housing cooperatives. Housing co-ops also offer opportunities for professional growth. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, any kind of cooperative is a form of a business. So uh, being engaged in a housing cooperative gives members hands-on experience in building management and understanding what an equity pool is and engaging in purchasing associations. Uh, all of these things uh, really do help the members also do a little bit of self-improvement uh, alongside of having the benefit of, ha of having member and resident controlled housing. Housing cooperatives also can really synergize as a part of larger economic models. Um, this is a, a example uh, of how a housing cooperative can work with a community land trust to ensure permanent affordability, uh, especially limited equity co-ops that have that kind of push uh, and that like uh, economic push to move to uh, market rate. Uh, having that limited equity housing co-op established on a community land trust with a deed restriction uh, can definitely like set up a system in which that uh, that market pressure has a wall that helps to kind of prevent uh, the LEC from moving into market rate. And I'll hand it off to Daniel uh, to talk a little bit more about the cooperative movement. Thank you, Ralph. Just want to give a quick couple of examples of ways in which cooperatives are embodying that cooperation among cooperatives principle. So talking about the co-op movement in North America, uh, in that tradition of uh, principle six, cooperation among cooperatives, there are many different co-op associations that are doing that work to knit together co-ops of every kind. Uh, each one of these co-ops is doing its own business, is taking care of the needs of its own members, is embedded in the local community, uh, but that may not immediately make it obvious and easy for them to reach out to other similar co-ops. So all over different business models and structures of co-op, we see organizations popping up to try and build those connections. So a few examples here in North America are the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation, the National Co-op Business Association, that's a United States National Co-op Business Association, the Canadian Cooperative Housing Federation, the Confederación Nacional de Cooperativas de Actividades Diversas, uh, the Federación Nacional de Cooperativas Financieras. Um, a quick fun fact, uh, NASCO, the North American Students Cooperation, was formed uh, years ago by members of what is now one of our member cooperatives visiting other countries and seeing that those countries' cooperatives had already formed federations to connect one another, share best practices, do lobbying work, uh, and wanted to reproduce some of those systems back home to connect the co-op that they were a part of. Um, some other things that are just sort of interesting facts about the co-op movement are that uh, across the world, roughly 12% of people on Earth are members of some form of co-op or another. Co-ops provide jobs or work opportunities to roughly 10% of the employed population. And then just a, a quick note to end on, you'll frequently see um, twin pines or twin trees in a co-op logo. I have some behind me here. Um, and a few examples here of temporary tattoos, hairstyles, or even pies. Um, and the reason for that symbol is that pine trees are a symbol for cooperatives in general, and that variations on those twin pines are used in different places, where those pine trees represent mutualism because pine trees grow better together in groups by working together. So there's a message about the importance of people working together, um, and that cooperatives are a great way for people to work together to meet their shared needs and goals. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, watching this presentation on Housing Co-ops 101. Uh, if you have uh, more questions or would like to know more about uh, housing cooperatives, feel free to reach out to North American Students of Cooperations at info at nasco.coop or check out our website at www.nasco.coop. We have not only resources uh, in our on our website, but we also have a detailed resource library that has many more uh, pieces of information available to you.